the animals called arthropods are invertebrates of highly varied forms. Their segmented bodies and jointed limbs evolved to adapt to any habitat. But all this diversity of shapes and lifestyles started with two types of arthropods, Megacherans and Isoxys. Despite the diversity of forms, arthropods can be classified into two groups. The ones having a mandibula are called mandibulates, and the ones having a chela in their first appendage are called chelicerates. These two traits, the chela and the mandibula, are definitive when it comes to identify a living arthropod. But when it comes to identify a species based on fossil evidence, we have to look into more than one trait to correctly assess their lineage. To group mandibulates and their relatives, we use the term crustaceomorpha. And to group chelicerates and their relatives, we use the term arachnomorpha. Sometime around the second stage of the Cambrian period, the first representatives of Crustaceomorpha and Arachnomorpha appeared. Fossil evidence coming out of Borges shells and Xinjiang represent our window to see how Crustaceomorphas and Arachnomorphas evolved in the third stage of the Cambrian. Isoxys, known for their carapaces that end in two spines, and megacurrents, the great appendage arthropods, coexisted in the same waters. While Isoxys used its first appendage looking for small animals and particles of food, megacurrents walked around the bottom using its first appendage to catch their prey. Their first appendage of both isoxys and megacurrents is located behind their eyes. This first appendage on both crustaceomorpha and arachnomorphos is associated with its second segment. The second segment in both is connected to a part of the brain called deutocerebrum. In modern crustaceomorphus, the deutocerebrum is connected to the antennules, and in modern arachnomorphus, the deutocerebrum is connected to the chelas. Radiodontans, animals closely related to arthropods, evolved the original appendage. It was used to get a hole into their prey, like in the case of megacurrents, but it probably also had olfactory receptors like an antennae. There has been much debate and controversy into knowing which structure came first after the radiodontan appendage. Both megacarans and isoxys are true arthropods, meaning that both have jointed limbs. The basal part of the true arthropods right now is that after the radiation of the animalocaris like arthropods, the radiodontan, then you have uh, a brain, what branches are from that is the isoxy, the uh, family that includes isoxys and, and some other relatives. And then from there, I was uh, finding uh, that the mega carrots were branching off the isoxids, and there's, uh, there's, no, there's, there's some consensus, consensus about this between the authors that is isoxids are actually uh, quite basal, uh, and that mega carrots are early true arthropods. Uh, what I'm f I've recently found is actually what I call a deep split phylogeny where you have the radiant dentons from where branch, from which branch the isoxids, and then you have this big split that on one side that you have the arachnomorph in the large sense that includes the megacarrots, and then you have uh, the total group mandibulates, they include all of the Bible arthropods and then they mandibulates. And so in that, uh, in that case, uh, the megacarrants, yes, they emerge, uh, they would emerge from uh, the same common ancestors.
minister that gave the exorcists and then they would give the arachnomorpha. Uh, so, but, I mean, there's always been to be a uh, close connection between the two. Uh, it is evident, but what, what, what's uh, intriguing, of course, is um, what is common ancestor to isoxids and the occurrence uh, look like, because there's, there's quite a number of differences between the two. Paleontologists were looking for an animal that looked like a radiodontant but also had their jointed limbs similar to the isoxys or the megacarens. They were looking for the missing link. A new fossil was found in China. The arthropod killing Xia had a radiodontan first appendage with jointed limbs following them. Killing Xia fits perfectly, diverging out of the radiodontans and being the point where the deep split occurred separating crustaceomorphus and arachnomorphus. When talking about megacarens and isoxys, we cannot refer to them as animals that got extinct. Even your average housefly has the isoxys in its roots. When we reverse evolution on a fly, we begin seeing traits like having long legs, long abdomen, and long wings. Going even further, we see the ability of folding the wings. We go even further and we see the first type of flying insects that connect with two types of modern insects. After that what it comes are the insects not capable of flying and their connection with the rest of the hexapodans. Then we reach the crustaceans that have similarities with the hexapods till we get to a crustacean that has all the traits that were lost in the hexapoda lineage two pairs of antennas and a shield to finally reach Ercaicunia from the Cambrian period Ercaicunia had two antennas like all the crustaceans and a carapace of shield Ercaicunia belonged to a group of arthropods that have a shield they are called the bivalve arthropods. They were recently known for having a mandibule, making them part of the members of Mandibulata. But Ercaicunia is the only one having two pairs of antennas, a true crustacean. Bivalve arthropods didn't rely heavily on their shield. The rear segments that form a tail were not covered by the carapace this increased the ability for swimming. When the bivalve arthropods started to increase their speed, they became capable of ambushing their prey. This led to a specialization of the appendages after the antennas. They transformed into mandibules and specialized grasping and walking legs. But the ancestral isoxys inherited the feeding style of the radiodontans. They remain in the water column looking for small particles of food to cross their path. This lifestyle could make isoxys an easy prey, but they were protected by their carapace. Some of the isoxys, like the isoxys paradoxus, had a long spine in the front of the carapace that enables the predators to eat them. Others like Tusoya, another member of the isoxids, created carapaces that resemble spiny torus shells. But at the end of the day, these isoxys branches died out and the only one remaining was the one capable of moving fast. And all of this started by the diversification of the isoxys. In the same way, your average house spider can trace their roots into the megacarens. When we reverse spider evolution, losing the functionality of the spinnerets to manipulate the silk. When we go back to the first arachnids capable of breathing air and the ones transitioning from water to land, we finally get to the earliest types of chelicerates. Chelicerates that are different than their modern counterparts. The original chelicerates had another branch 
on top of the walking leg. Normally the upper branch is used for breathing, but in the case of the early glycerates, this branch was another articulated limb. The breathing appendage are the book lungs at the rear position. If we go even further back in time, we go to the earliest known glycerate, Molisonia. Molisonia had their first appendage, Aquila, and also had similarities with the Ophacodus by having the Viremus head appendages and the hexapods at the rear position that resemble the book lungs. Habelia and Sanctacaris are the link between the true glycerates and the megacarens. They possess seven appendages at the head area, like any glycerate, but those appendages are Viremus, connecting them with Ophacodus and also the megacarens. From them we connect the megacarens to the glycerates by having the first appendage transforming into a pincer and having the same amount of segments in the body. There is an independent branch of the arachnomorpha where the trilobites and their relatives evolve from. Megacarens like Lynchioilia with their first appendage already looking like an antennae and their head shield already looking like a trilobite cephalon are important to understand the evolution of the archipodons. There is a member of the archipodon called Emeraldella that is worth mentioning. Well, what you can see actually, uh, which is interesting with uh, the specimen that was published uh, from Utah, uh, because it's a lateral view, what's actually striking is the, similar, the overall similarity between Emeraldella and this lateral view and a mega current. So yes, you have antennae, but the way the antennae are attached in the head, um, the disposition of the limbs, uh, this is very reminiscent uh, of mega currents. And I think this characterizes what I mean, you know, the main clade uh, that regroups both trilobite-like um, uh, animals uh, and the glycerate, which uh, is called the arachnomorpha. So there's one fundamental thing uh, that needs to be mentioned when um, talking about the relationship between trilobite relatives and glycerates. Since we described, uh, re-described the Hathalia, what we, what we found in this taxon is, a, is that the post-cephalic appendages, the appendages posterior to the head, they are mega chiron like so they correspond to this great appendage of arthropods that we know uh, are more basal uh, within the evolution of, of true arthropods. And these appendages are relatively simple, and most importantly, they don't have this large masticatory glassal bases that we know. Um, in all the um, in all the uh, the archipodons and trilobites and trilobite relatives, and these class of bases, they're present in all the appendages, except of course the first one. It, you cannot uh, put uh, things that are related to trilobites and uh, after. Depending on the type of isoxys, the first appendage is still looking like the radiodontan appendage. In some others, the antennae is already formed, 
from the isoxys that have the antennal mandibulates evolve, but isoxys keep evolving on their own, creating alternative branches, specifically evolving their carapace. With no doubt, the carapace was a fundamental part of the isoxys life cycle. It not only served as a protection against predators, but it also served as an isolated chamber for their eggs. By having a carapace, isoxys achieved two things. First, they increased the amounts of eggs not being eaten by predators. And second, they ensured their offsprings reached a stage of development where they were able to survive on their own. The head shield of Megacarens, or Cephalon, had a similar purpose. It protected their eggs till they hatched to become miniature versions of the adults. The early Megacarens were multi-segmented, with some of them having up to 38 appendages in their bodies. Their great appendage had four Amy or four points of contact. They pretty much serve as forks, allowing them to hold and lift little animals before entering their mouths. Some of the Megacarens were probably scavengers, like in the case of Yohoya, waiting for little particles of food to fall from the water column to catch them with their great appendage. Other Megacarens, like High Caris, were active predators. They ambushed their prey to crush them with their pincers, but other Megacarens had more ingenious ways to kill their prey. The Enchoilia burrow their bodies under the sand, placing their great appendage folded under its body, and letting the flagella expose on top of the sand. Flagellas fulfilled two functions, to detect the animals getting closer and to confuse them with the appearance of worms. Once a curious animal approached, the Enchoilia extended their appendages at high speed to grab their prey. Long Raimi helped to get a hold on them even if they retreated a little bit. The feeding habits that began in the Cambrian Oceans remain the same. Horseshoe crabs are active predators that feed on small clams, crustaceans, worms, and even algae. Shrimp feed some small worms, algae, and decaying pieces of other animals, just like the Isoxys did long time ago. Megacarens and Isoxys were prehistoric versions of what was to come. With their innovative appendages and shields, they had the tools to conquer. These tiny Cambrian creatures lived their legacy to the most successful animals on the planet. They will continue to live on.